Okay. We are alive uh, in the YouTube channel of IMP. Hi, everybody. I'm André Milone. I work as a senior researcher in astrophysics in National Institute for Space Research in Portuguese. Instituto Nacional de Pesquisas Espaciais, or shortly, INP, in Portuguese, as well. Good afternoon to all of you who are following us along the online seminar organized by the Astrophysics Division in the INPIS YouTube channel. Today, we have a seminar by Rafael Haywood from University of Exeter, UK, who is going to present a touch impacting issue. Our online seminar will run every Tuesday until mid-December. Invite your friends to join them. Register yourself on the IMPS channel. And don't forget to activate the notifications. I also remind you to leave a like every seminar you enjoy. Uh, unfortunately, there is not Astro News today. Astro News is a short report of a recent published work on astronomy, astrophysics, or cosmology, which is usually given by a student from our astrophysics graduate course at IMP. Uh, so, uh, moving backward to what I was saying, the today's seminar is about a very interesting issue. Let me show the advertisement of this seminar. Uh, so, uh, the today's seminar is about the astronomical identity of our planet Earth, pointed out by the Amazon forest. Whom is going to offer us this interesting subject is Rafael Haywood. Now, I would like to introduce her to all of you. Dr. Rafael Haywood is a lector in physics and astronomy at the University of Exeter. Who hunts, who, sorry, who hunts for planets that orbit other, other stars, the exoplanets. Before joining Exeter, Rafaela was a NASA Sagan Fellow at Harvard University, USA. Rafael holds a master's in physics from Imperial College London and a PhD in astrophysics from University of St. Andrews. In her PhD dissertation, she developed a, an innovative technique for determining the masses of exoplanets, which now set the standard in the astronomic community. She currently advises NASA, or, or NASA in Portuguese, <laughs> and the U.S. National Science Foundation on finding Earth-like planet, planets. To deepen her understanding of global challenges at home on Earth, Rafaela recently obtained a certificate in sustainability at Harvard's Extension, Extension School. Last year, she was invited to NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., to speak about her engagement on social and environmental issues as an astronomer. I had personally the chance of meeting Rafael in the first time in a high precision spectroscopy workshop organized by Professor Jorge Melendez from University of Sao Paulo. Now, uh, in, in a few seconds, we are going to have the seminar of Rafaela. So you can post questions and comments to Rafael during the seminar in the YouTube chat. Don't be shy. The speaker will reply then immediately after the seminar. 
I recommend you to place questions and comments in English, please. <laughs> Be welcome, every, everyone, in YouTube, and enjoy the seminar. Rafael, from now on, you can share your presentation. Thank you in advance for accepting our invitation. Are you ready? So, go ahead. The time is yours. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and your invitation. And uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon or good evening, if that's the case for you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm very excited today to be talking about uh, the Amazon rainforest uh, in its astronomical perspective. And the reason this talk is, is this is a timely topic because in the last couple of decades, we've discovered thousands of planets that orbit other stars than our own sun. So planets beyond our solar system that we know as exoplanets, that we refer to as exoplanets. And, and we know now that there are more exoplanets, uh, that there are more planets. I'm just seeing if this is moving. Oh, I think I have to click here. Okay, there we are. Technical glitch resolved. Sorry. We know that there are more planets in our galaxy than there are stars. And this is a very recent discovery if you think about um, humanity's knowledge for the last millennia. Uh, we've found out, we've discovered exoplanets. The first one we found in 1995, it was 51 Pegasi b. And, and since then, over the last 20 years, we've found thousands. And so we're now able to conclude that there are um, loads and loads of planets in the galaxy. And, and so much so that we are now in this unique position in humanity's um, story, in history, where we can discover and characterize nearby exoplanets, so uh, small planets in our celestial neighborhood, relatively close to uh, our own solar system, uh, and we can examine their atmospheres. We've started making observations of their atmospheres, and very soon we're going to be able to assess uh, the potential of these exoplanets for hosting life. Uh, and by very soon, I mean in the next, in our generation, in this generation. And, and so we are on track to, um, we're on this fascinating journey where we are able to ask questions such as, um, what makes a planet habitable? Uh, what are the atmospheres of, of these planets made of? Uh, and is there a life on exoplanets and other planets beyond the solar system? So the quest for life beyond our solar system is, is incredibly fascinating. It's also a really um, complex question. So I've broken it down here into three steps. Um, the first step is, is we need to discover these planets that might host life. So by this, I mean looking for uh, Earth to Neptune sized planets, uh, so sm relatively small exoplanets in our celestial neighborhood. So fairly close by, although as we'll see later on in this talk, they're actually quite far away. Uh, but relatively speaking on, on uh, cosmological time scales, they're on spatial scales, they're very close by. Uh, and once we've discovered these planets, so this is something that uh, the TESS mission by NASA, also you may have heard of the Kepler mission, uh, they've been finding thousands of exoplanets and, and also uh, the European Space Agency's PLATO mission is going to be launching in about five years now. And they're discovering thousands of exoplanets uh, that are of Earth to Neptune size. And once we have these discoveries, we need to confirm and characterize them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that because, uh, as Andrew mentioned, this is what I work on specifically. And once we've confirmed and characterized these planets, uh, we can select the best ones to uh, observe them with um, future space missions uh, that uh, we can observe their atmospheres and we can actually deduce um, what the atmospheres contain and whether they might potentially uh, host life. And, and some of these missions are uh, NASA's uh, JWST, so the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is launching in a, about a year's time. 
and the Ariel uh, mission also by the European Space Agency, it was just announced that they are selecting it to move forward. So Ariel will be looking at uh, about a thousand exoplanets. It will be looking at their atmospheres. So, and this is, Ariel is planned for launch at the end of the decade. So this is really, we're looking at the next decade um, are gonna give us some really tantalizing observations uh, to and we will potentially discover biosignatures, so signatures of life on planets beyond our solar system. So I work on uh, confirming planets uh, that have been discovered by uh, Kepler and TESS and other missions. And one very successful method for this is to look at, so we're looking at the star because the planet is, is so small compared to the star it's invisible, but the star, if it has a planet orbiting it, the star is moving and so it's wobbling. And so the star's light, uh, which if you split into a spectrum as shown on this animation, the star's light is going more to the blue and more to the red as the planet is tugging onto the star. And so we can detect this Doppler shift with a spectrograph and, and we can, if we can see this shift, then we can confirm that there is a planet there. And the really exciting thing about this technique is that the amount by which the star moves tells you it's directly proportional to the mass of the planet. So this radial velocity technique allows us to determine a planet's most fundamental parameter, because indeed uh, you need the mass to learn anything about a planet. You, the, the mass of the planet tells you about the interior of the planet, so what its composition is, uh, what its interior structure might be, and also uh, when we're going to be scheduling observations with the James Webb Space Telescope and other ground telescopes, uh, as well as Ariel in the long term, uh, we need to know the mass of the planet because it tells us whether the atmosphere is, is really squashed, in which case um, you know, if the planet is very massive, then the atmosphere is squashed and we might not be able to observe the atmosphere. Um, so, and, and on the other hand, if the mass is just right, then we might have the capability to observe the atmosphere. So we, we really need to know the mass so that we can select those prime targets for atmospheric uh, follow-up. And also there are degeneracies between the mass and, and the composition of the atmosphere uh, in these observations we'll be getting of the atmospheres. So mass is a really important parameter. And um, just to give you a flavor of, of what I specifically work on, uh, I'm actually looking at the stars that host these planets because um, stars are these big balls of plasma. And as you know, and, and they're constantly, they have flows constantly bubbling up to the surface and there are magnetic fields that interact with all of this and this creates noise in the exoplanet observations uh, in radio velocity observations and uh, i am basically modeling these uh the stellar activity these stellar signals which are noise uh, so that we can better characterize the planets so that we can get more precise masses and in turn this will help us uh, do better follow-up uh, when we look at their atmospheres. Right, so this is going into the detail and it, it gives you a flavor of, of how, um, how, how much in detail we're able to go. I mean, we're really able to probe the surfaces of stars. We're, we're able to look at how the surfaces of stars impact our detections of these planets beyond our solar system. And, and so this, this shows that in the last two decades, since we found the first exoplanet, 51 Peg B, we've really come a long way. Uh, and, and, and that's very exciting. It's a very exciting field. So there are, I think, in my mind, there are two big lessons that we've learned uh, from exoplanet observations, looking back at the big picture, so zooming out. Uh, the first one, is that planets are really common. So I already mentioned this, that there are more, star more planets than there are stars in our galaxy. And 
Uh, this has been confirmed observationally. There are many stars that we look at that have planets. They have multiple planets. The other finding is that exoplanets are really diverse. So there are all kinds of exoplanets. Uh, pretty much any planet you can imagine, it probably exists, I think. So we first found these very um, strange planets, the hot Jupiters. So they're the size of Jupiter, um, but they're way, way closer in to their star than even Mercury is in our system. So this is unlike anything we have in the solar system. And we also discovered loads of super Earths. So these are um, between five to 10 times the mass of Earth. We're still trying to understand what their compositions are. It's, it's thought that many of them are rocky like Earth. Uh, but again, they're, they're much bigger than us, so they're a different kind of planet. Uh, and there are also many Neptunes, which are a little bit bigger, again, than those super Fs, but they're still smaller than Neptune. And, and we've also found uh, several um, Earth-sized planets, so planets about the size of the Earth. And in fact, the observations that we've been obtaining uh, a lot of them thanks to Kepler, uh, but also many other surveys that are ongoing, both on the ground and in space, uh, are enabling us to constrain the occurrence rates of these planets uh, that are about the same size as Earth. So what I mean by Earth-like planets is, is two things. Basically that they're about the same size as Earth, and also that they are in, in the so-called habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, where liquid water can be present. So they're at a distance from their star that is just such that they can have liquid water on the surface. The temperature is just right. So they receive approximately the same amount of, of heat from their parent star as we do on Earth from the sun. And Really, I should say, rather than Earth-like planets, these are really just uh, temperate um, Earth-sized planets. Okay, so they're, they're only Earth-like insofar that when we are observing them with our very uh, raw techniques right now, they look Earth-like. Uh, their observable properties are Earth-like, but Maybe if we look in the details, they're not going to be Earth-like, right? And I'll, I'll come back to that. So there was this study uh, by Koparapu et al. Uh, in 2018 that was actually a compilation of studies. So many different analyses were made based on existing observations of exoplanets. And they found that the occurrence rate of Earth-like planets, of temperate Earth-sized planets, is about one in five stars like our own sun. And, and because they did many different analyses, they actually have a, a lower bound and an upper bound. So if you're on the pessimistic side, uh, they found about one in 10 stars and the more uh, optimistic studies found that all stars, virtually all stars had a planet that fulfilled these criteria. So this is really exciting. Uh, I do wanna say, so these, these numbers are based on observations, existing observations. Uh, they did have to extrapolate a little bit because um, most of the planets that we know of right now are slightly bigger and slightly hotter than Earth, than the Earth is. So they had to extrapolate down to um, smaller planets, more like Earth. And, and the other thing is that uh, we should keep in mind that uh, the space that we've probed with our observations. Um, so you've got the, uh, an artist impression of the galaxy here, and, and we're here, the sun is here. And in red, this is showing you what we've probed, the amount of space. So when we then extrapolate to the galaxy, just keep in mind that we're assuming that the rest of the galaxy is just like our own solar neighborhood. And so if we do this, we say, okay, there are uh, 300 billion stars like the sun in the galaxy. And if 21% of them have an Earth-like planet, then we end up 
with 63 billion temperate Earth-sized planets. So this really puts our own Earth into context, doesn't it? It it makes us think, okay, there are there are loads of planets that are roughly similar to ours. And it, it makes us want to ask, what do these planets look like? How how similar are they really to our own Earth? And and we can't look at them in detail just yet. Our technology um isn't advanced enough. Even the James Webb Space Telescope and Ariel that I mentioned earlier, uh, they're really going to be looking at the broad properties of, of these planets. Um, but we can look at the geological record of our own Earth. Uh, and we can see, if we do this, that over the last five billion years, uh, Earth has been many planets, as Sarah Ruckheimer says so aptly. And, and that means that over the course of its history, even though Earth has always been the same size, and it has always more or less had the same amount of heat from the sun, um, it has been wildly different. So it's been a very different place. And, and I'll note that actually very small variations in temperature uh, make the difference between habitats that are um, hospitable to life or, or very dangerous. And, and that's, that's important for us to, to keep in mind uh, when putting Earth and, and our, our home into perspective. So going back to those 63 billion temperate Earth-sized planets, we can conclude based on the geological record from Earth that it's most likely that every single one of these planets is going to be very different uh, to one another and to our own Earth, right? And so every planet is unique, just like every one of us is, is a unique person. We're all different, right? And, and this makes us ask, um, a, well, a, a very important part of of looking at ourselves in this astronomical perspective um, is we need to keep in mind where these planets are um, because the scales are, are quite mind-boggling. So there's our solar system, not to scale. And for this experiment, this thought experiment, I'm going to use um, the, the time that sunlight takes to travel from, well, from the sun out into outer space. Uh, as a measure. And, and to get to Earth, it takes eight minutes. To get to the end of our solar system, uh, it takes 140 hours. To go to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, we need four years at the speed of light. And, and the planets that we are discovering, the exoplanets that um, I've been talking about, they're at about 50 to 3,000 uh, years away at the speed of light. So these planets are very far away and, and we're, not, um, we're not going to these planets anytime soon. We don't have the technological or economical capability to do that. And, and that's really important, I think, to bear in mind. And, and the reason we're studying these planets is, is not to eventually go there or to maybe communicate with whatever is on these planets. Uh, I think it's more about uh, just putting our own planet into perspective for, for our own philosophical purposes and scientific purposes too. So looking at all these observations, we find that uh, placing Earth in its astronomical and geological context demonstrates that Earth is really our only home for the next while to come, for the next generations. So this is um, becoming philosophical and, and in a way we realize that as we are looking at all these exoplanets, uh, so in my work and along with my colleagues who study, discover, characterize exoplanets, uh, we find that 
looking out actually makes us reflect back on on our own home on our own earth and on ourselves as well and and Carl Sagan put it very aptly uh, in this quote by him uh, the exploration of the cosmos is a voyage of self-discovery so now we can ask well what do we look like uh, what, what does Earth look like from outside of the solar system, from abroad, from distance? And so this is what we're going to look at now. I'm going to zoom out from Earth um, with pictures. So this is what Earth looks like from uh, orbit on board the International Space Station. You'll note that um, you can see the thin atmosphere at the top of Earth. It's very thin. You can see it. Uh, you can also see features, you can see clouds, you can see the ocean, you can see land. So you can, you can see a lot of things from orbit. And here's uh, a photo uh, from orbit as well of Rio and Sao Paulo uh, at night. And it, it, shows our, it shows the human's impact as well. Uh, so if we zoom out a little bit more, if we go on the moon, uh, this is Earth seen from the moon as it was um, to the astronauts that went there. And you can see that, again, you still have spatial information. You can still see the clouds, you can see the oceans, you can see the land. And now, okay, let's go to the end of the solar system. And this is what the Voyager probe did. Uh, back in the 1980s and then it looked around and it took this famous photo uh, that Carl Sagan named the pale blue dot. And what we are looking at here is, so it's looking back towards Earth from the edge of the solar system. And this is Earth. This is the pale blue dot. And now this becomes really interesting because we are looking at Earth within a single pixel it occupies about a tenth of a pixel in this image so all of the information that we could see prior from orbit so the the clouds the the oceans the atmosphere um the land all of that information is now within a single pixel and we have to this is the kind of observation that we're looking at when we're looking at exoplanets we're looking at planets as single points and, and this is what we have to learn from them. So these, these observations are very uh, relevant to exoplanet studies because um, these observations of Earth, because they give us a test case for what we're going to be looking at with future missions. And what I would like to ask is what would the Amazon rainforest look like if we observed it on an exoplanet? So we do have observations of this. Uh, we didn't need to go out on a distant exoplanet to, to look back at Earth as an exoplanet. We actually, um, astronomers did something uh, very clever, is that you can look at Earth shine. So this is, um, this is the moon that we're looking at. And maybe you've seen it like this before. You can see the crescent. And you can also see the rest of the moon, which should be invisible, but you can actually just about see it. And, and that part is called the Earth shine. And it's sunlight that bounced off of the Earth and then reflected back off of the moon again. So let's just look at this um, in slightly more detail. So we've got the sunlight that hits the moon, you've got the little crescent, and then the rest of it goes to Earth. Um, some of it goes to Earth, and then it gets ref so it hits. It goes through the Earth's atmosphere. It hits the ground, the land, and the oceans, and then some of it is reflected back out to the Moon. And that's what we observe with a telescope on Earth. So this experimental setup allows us to look at Earth as if it were a distant exoplanet. Uh, and in this case, it's just a point of light, it's a speck of light. And what we can do to extract information from this point of light with no space, there is no spatial information, but there is spectral information. So we can 
put the light through a prism, through a spectrograph, and we can obtain a spectrum of Earth. And this is what we are looking at here. So um, this is these are observations from a paper from uh, Margaret Turnbull et al. in 2006. And you are looking at the brightness on the y-axis, so the relative reflectance as a function of color um, given by wavelength. So uh, this is the light of that that dis well that point of light from Earth from the Earth shine split into its colors, and and this is the fingerprint of Earth uh, as as we would see it from a distant um, location, as we would see it as an exoplanet. Um, and there are multiple features. This is what the first thing we can see, and and if we look in more detail. We can see that these are water bands. So these tell us that there is water vapor in the atmosphere of Earth, and they tell us that the Earth is habitable by our definition of habitability. Uh, and, and if we look closely, we also see uh, oxygen features as well as methane. And the combination, the simultaneous presence of oxygen and methane tells us that the Earth is inhabited. So it, it's a signature of life. And, um, and it's produced by, by the plants and, and everything that's living on Earth. So uh, I recommend this paper uh, by Vicky Meadows um, if you're interested in, in looking at uh, what constitutes a biosignature. So the planet is habitable, it's inhabited. Uh, we also see the Rayleigh scattering, so that slope uh, is due to the, the sky being blue and, and reflecting blue light. And we also see this feature here, which I'm going to focus on moving on, uh, which is produced by vegetation. So let's look at the signature of vegetation. These are now, so the previous plot, those were observations, and now these are I'm going to show you models of different kinds of vegetation. So uh, we've got coral, trees, um, sea slug, apparently, <laughs> a kind of vegetation uh, chosen by the authors, um, like an algae and cyanobacteria. So different types of vegetation. And what these authors did is they used uh, sophisticated models based on observations to um, produce the uh, spectrum of this uh, of these different types of vegetation. And so this is what we get. And you can see that there is a lot of variability between the different kinds of vegetation. You see different things. But overall, you see that there is this common feature here at about 700 nanometers, this sharp incline. So uh, that's a common feature to vegetation. It's called the red edge because it's in the red part of the spectrum. And it's due to uh, the chlorophyll, which over in the optical, in the visible, chlorophyll, which is the green stuff in, in plants, uh, it, it reflects, um, it reflects or it's, uh, yeah, it reflects, it absorbs, sorry, it absorbs all the light in the visible, but chlorophyll becomes transparent in the infrared. And so then you have this large increase in reflectance here. So this is a signature that is very specific to um, vegetation. And so we can ask, would the Amazon rainforest have the same signature and, and could we see it? And we have observations for this. So this is the red edge, this feature. And now these are again, Earthshine observations um, taken by uh, Sarah Seeger's team uh, back in 2005. And what they did is that they observed, they took two observations of Earth. So the first one, which I'm gonna show you here, is taken when the Earth was facing the moon in this configuration. So the ocean was facing the moon. So it's looking at 
Earth's ocean. And this is what we saw. This is what uh, Sarah Seeger's team saw. And I will note now that the, so we're still looking at a spectrum with the, the, the brightness and, and the wavelength. Uh, but we are zooming in onto that red edge feature, so in the infrared. And so we see this spectrum. Now, if we look at the other observation that uh, Sarah Seeger's team took, the other feature, the other observation was when South America was facing the moon. And so they were looking at South America and, and really they were looking at the Amazon rainforest. And this is the other one. And now if we superimpose both observations, you can see that they're different, right? And in fact, so the, the one with the land is a little bit brighter than the one with just the ocean. Uh, Galileo figured this out back in 1632. The, the land, as you can see on the image, the land is brighter than the oceans, so it reflects more. And, and if you look here, that is the red edge signature. So this sharp increase at about 700 nanometers, that is caused directly by the Amazon rainforest. And, and these kinds of observations are, are similar uh, in quality, qualitatively, they're similar to the observations that we'll be making of, of exoplanets, of, of Earth-like planets in the coming decades in our generation. And, and this is really showing us um, that the Amazon rainforest is visible at astronomical distances, and it's an integral part of Earth's astronomical identity. So if we were to look at Earth, as an exoplanet uh, from another part of the galaxy, we would see, we would be able to, if we had precise enough instruments, we'd be able to see the Amazon rainforest. So just to finish off, um, I'm looking forward to taking questions very soon. Uh, recent observations of exoplanets uh, that have really boomed in the last two decades, uh, we're talking about just in 20 years time, we found out that uh, planets, including temperate and Earth-sized planets, uh, similar to our own, are ubiquitous. So they're everywhere. They're really common. And placing at the same time, when we place the Earth in this astronomical context and also in its geological context, we see that Earth is constantly changing. Um, and and we also see that it's it's really our only home because um, it's um, the distances to other planets are astronomical. Uh, we're not going there, and and also each and every one of these uh, Earth-like planets um, is really unique. It's very different. It's going. They're all going to be looking unique. So Earth has a unique fingerprint, uh, as we saw in the spectrum and we can observe it and we we know that it's constantly changing because earth has evolved uh, continuously over the last four billion years five billion years and and we saw that the amazon rainforest is visible from astronomical distances so with all this in mind i i want to ask the question uh what will the amazon rainforest's astronomical identity uh, look like tomorrow uh, and I want to thank you all, and I look forward to taking questions. Thank, thank you, you, Rafael, for the excellent seminar you have had for us today. So, congratulations for the seminar. Oh, uh, thank you. My pleasure. It's it's an <laughs> honor to be visiting. <laughs> so. Uh, it's time to solve questions. Let me see if you have uh, some questions in the YouTube YouTube chat. So I have got one, the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, the question uh, has made by uh, uh, Odilio Aguiar, who is a faculty member of our graduate course in astrophysics at INPE. 
So he asked about how much the surface of the moon would change the spectrum coming from Earth, the influence of the moon in the spectrum of the Earth. That's a, a really great question, and I, I completely skipped over that. Uh, but in the paper, in Margaret Turnbull's paper, they they go through. They have to do quite a few steps to um, basically transform um, the Earthshine spectrum from you know what they're calling the raw data to uh, a spectrum of Earth as an exoplanet. And indeed, the the surface of the Moon um, it's in homogeneity inhomogeneous uh, because it has craters and, and uh, different features on it and and it um, it doesn't rotate but it the inhomogeneity might um, impact the um, the the spectrum that we get although because the moon is tidally locked at least we don't have a rotational modulation from from the moon because then the inhomogeneities would produce a modulation you know as a function of that would change as the rotation as the moon rotates so that's that's a little bit easier in that respect um there are also the um they ha they had to account for um the well the when it goes through the atmosphere of the earth and then back again it goes twice right so i think they had to account for that and they also had to remove um the fingerprint of the sun's light because they would have had the spectrum of the sun in in the light that they got as well so there are quite a few steps that's a great question okay thank you uh claudia vilega rodrigues who is the coordinator of our great course, asks uh, a question, let me read it. Is there any comparison between Earth shine spectra from South America and less green? And less green, but ground portion of the globe, Sahara, so let me ask it again. Let me read it again, sorry. Is there any comparison between Earth shine spectra from South America and less green? Because and less green, like um, the desert? Like, like a Sahara desert. Okay. Um, for instance, um, uh, for instance, with the difference of the spectra when you have South America and with Amazon forest and Sahara. And you have a so, large portion of the land, uh, like a desert. I don't know. Um, I'm not, and I wouldn't say that there aren't because maybe I missed the studies. Um, the there is a, an excellent review of observations of Earth as an exoplanet by Tyler Robinson in 2018, uh, and I I know that there are not too many observations of Earthshine um, looking at Earth as an exoplanet and specifically I do think that I mean these observations are not being used to look at Earth specifically we always have the exoplanets in mind and, and we have the I mean what people are doing with these observations they're trying to to figure out what the um, you know, what the future space missions should be like. So HabEx and Louvoir by NASA, for example, uh, that will um, directly image, so take photos of, of other um, Earth-sized planets. Um, they're trying to figure out what the um, technical specifications of these missions should be. And that's been the, the global, the main aim, but I suspect there is a lot we could do taking more Earthshine observations uh, in order to look specifically at, at Earth and, and at, you know, what the Amazon rainforest looks like and, and how it compares to all these different types of and Absolutely. Mm. The next question uh, is from 
Arthur Reis, who is a student of our graduate course. Is there hope for an indicator for volcanic activity as particulates on the atmosphere that, that yes. uh, let's Sorry. articulate on the atmosphere? It's a kind of, of question of the uh, indicator, a spectral indicator for volcanic activity. Is it, um, are you basically, Arthur, asking if um, the, if a volcano went off, then it would produce a signature in the atmosphere that might be, that might look like life, that might look like a biosignature? As, as, that's how I'm understanding the question. Um, and, and if that's the question, then I, um, I would recommend looking at a very recent paper by Vicky Meadows uh, in 2018 that I, I think I had on my slides. Um, they looked they looked at every kind of scenario on Earth, so every geological process that could give rise to um, something that would look like a biosignature. That you know, if you looked at it, we would say, "Oh, there's life," when in fact it's it's just a volcano going off. And what they found is that really what you want is the simultaneous presence of oxygen, methane, and water. So previously, uh, a lot of the consensus was that you just, if you just saw oxygen on its own, then that was, that was life. But then, yeah, there are all these false positives. So, so methane and oxygen together and water vapor is really what we need to look for. I hope this answers your question. It's great well, to have questions from students. <laughs> I agree. With you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose that you, uh, a great signal to noise to for the spectrum of uh, exoplanet. So you need a long exposition, long, a, long, uh, a long exposure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, it, every exoplanet has uh, spin. Yeah. Yeah. When you get the spectra, you are going to take a long exposure during some time. How much time do you need to collect a good quality spectrum for the reflexive spectrum of the exoplanet to extract and identify the uh, infrared features in absorption that you have shown to all of us during the seminar? Do you have yeah. some expectation about the, the 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 exposure time that you need in order to collect a good quality spectrum? I think on what I've read, um, there are studies that look at the exp that are computing the exposure time uh, needed by uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, for example. So Caroline Morley. Uh, is looking at that and Natasha Battaglia as well um, and other people. Uh, these are the two names that come to mind. And I think that they were counting, so we're really looking at the brightest stars, uh, the planets orbiting the brightest stars, uh, and, and they're looking at hours, several hours of exposure time. And indeed, when you're doing this, so one, it's very expensive. So we need to, that's why we need to know the planets really well. So we need to know their masses and we need to have an idea of, of how long it will take and, and what we're going to get from these atmospheric observations uh, before we do it, because they take a lot of time. So they cost a lot of money. Um, and, and the other thing, yeah, I, I think, I mean, everything shows that there's going to be variability on these timescales. I mean, we know on Earth that the, the clouds 
change as a function of over time, over short time scales of hours. Um, another thing is that, well, the exposure time might be a few hours and then you'll have to take maybe a dozen of these observations and average them together, right? So, so then you're looking at averaging the variability over time scales of weeks, months, maybe even years. And, and yeah, that's going to be a big challenge. Absolutely. And we have observed uh, clouds. We know there are clouds on exoplanets. Oh. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope has made fantastic observations of clouds and Spitzer and, and ground-based observatories as well. Um, and actually in the, in the Earthshine study I showed by Margaret Turnbull, um, they did have to account for uh, to model the variability of, of the clouds in the spectrum and, mm. and the dynamicism of the spectrum. Yeah, that's going to be a huge challenge. Variability. Um, right now, in my work, we're challenged by the variability of the stars. And, and that's also going to impact those spectra. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I could imagine the great or huge challenge that you have mentioned right now, especially when you have a homogeneity distribution of vegetation uh, on the surface of the exoplanet, and you don't know the uh, uh, spin period of the planet itself. So we were going, you are going to have a, a kind of integrate uh, yeah. spectrum in time, but you don't see exactly the difference between the spectrum that has a great, uh, great influence of the uh, uh, huge uh, forest when you when Sorry, between when you have an influence of a great coverage of vegetable and a great part of the surface that it be covered by water or oceans or clouds. Of course, don't need to comment any, anything more about this issue. Let's yeah. move the, for the next question that I can collect in the YouTube. You have uh, had another one. Well, I'll, I'll just say that the the study that I showed, I mean, these are these are ideal case scenarios. Of course, there are going to be many challenges with exo real exoplanet data of actual exoplanets, including know, those. Yeah, yeah. yeah those are going to yeah. be huge challenges. Right. Yeah. The infrared can be exploring deep. The infrared part of the spectrum in the yeah. red. How can I say the red jump? The red jump. The red edge? Yeah. yeah. The red, red, red edge. Go. Yeah. Let's move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mentioned he chose. You, you, you mentioned we will be we will be able to measure the spectra of exoplanets in the next decades. Can you tell us more about how this will be done? Tales. How we are going to collect uh, real spectra of exoplanets? So the the nearest, the soonest. Um, well, we we are. I should say we we are already observing um, spectra of exoplanets um, okay. of large planets. So the hot Jupiters that are very close to their stars and they're very big and and so. Uh, looking at the brightest stars, um, where we have the most information, it's all photons from the star um, that are imprinted by the planet. Um, the, we're already looking at that. So the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, Spitzer, um, on the ground, we have um, the Espresso uh, spectrograph um, on the very large telescope in Chile. Um, that is is taking high, very high resolution spectra, and it can look at um, at hot Jupiter. So we're looking at very large planets that have a large signature. Uh, the the real challenge is going to 
smaller planets um, because their signatures are going to be much smaller. Uh, you have to think about you're looking at you're looking at the star, <laughs> uh, and and if the planet is really small in comparison to this, the smaller it is, the more difficult it is. And one way one way we are going to go around this is by looking at the smallest stars. So the M dwarfs um, in particular, which are some of them are ten times smaller than our sun, and so the Earth. An Earth-sized planet orbiting an M dwarf comparably looks bigger. It has a bigger signature. So that's one way we're going to be observing the spectra of, of other Earths. I mean, Earth-sized planets. Um, and and James Webb, the James Webb Space Telescope, will do that. It's launching next year. Uh, James Webb will look at the methane band and the oxygen band, amongst other spectral ranges. And so if we combine that with observations of um, from the ground, so for example, Espresso can look at, um, is it, there's Espresso, there's also on the Giant Magellan Telescope, um, GCLEF um, is going to be a new spectrograph in the next few years. And that, uh, I think they're planning an oxygen band. They're gonna observe oxygen. So if you combine these observations, we have a chance at getting at biosignatures. Uh, but it will, um, James W, the James Webb Space Telescope, it will take a, a team effort. People, uh, scientists will have to decide which stars, which planets to observe. And, and they're gonna be able to observe maybe a, a few dozen where, so, because they take a lot of time and a lot of resources. Uh, and then in the longer term, so at the end of the decade, 2030 or so, Ariel will look at about a thousand hot Jupiters to Neptune type planets. Uh, um, and in the next couple of decades, we're looking at um, NASA is planning uh, HabEx or LUVAR, uh, one of these two projects, uh, space missions, that will directly image other us so that's that's the plan um and that they will do it for maybe it depends how common f like planets are i mean if they look at a hundred stars how many <laughs> so we need to find the planets first so that these missions can go and find you know they can look directly at the planets. we know they're there yeah i hope this answers your question so in the next 20 to 30 years, I think we're we're going to get very good clues. But now, in the current time, how many candidates do you have to, to look for biosignatures uh, in the interstellar planets? Do you have a, 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 a candidate to sample? So there is no current candidate that orbits a star like the sun. The okay. candidates that we have that are Earth size and, and in at the same temperature, so the same sort of distance, same kind of orbit, um, are orbiting those M dwarfs, those small planets, uh, those small stars, because they're easier to find. It's easier to find a, an Earth mass planet around a, a tiny star because it pulls on it quite a bit more. Uh, and it's also, the star is smaller, so it's cooler. So the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone is a lot closer in. So the planet goes around more times and that makes it easier to find it. So um, we do have, well, I think, I mean, Caroline Molly's papers would tell you this. Um, I'm sure people could come up with at least half a dozen or maybe a dozen yes. candidates uh, that they're going to be orbiting these different stars. So they're not quite like Earth. Um, but then again, even if they orbited the, a sun like star, <laughs> they would be very different. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, just now, there are a few candidates. <laughs> Yeah, to, and, and test, to for. the test mission is, that's the goal of the test mission, is to create a sample. 
So Tesh is looking at the whole sky and it's looking at the brightest stars, which are the most interesting because uh, the brighter the star, the more photons, the better observations you have. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for answering my questions and the questions from the audience of YouTube. Odilio Aguiar, thank you. Uh, thanks you uh, uh, as well. So you are closing to the, the, the to, to finish you know, the, the, the transmission. So Rafael, we don't have more questions from YouTube. Congratulations once more for the excellent seminar. Well, thank and, uh, you for having me. <laughs> I hope to visit soon in person. <laughs> okay. If you want, you can say some final words right now before we finish the transmission. I just want to say that um, we're going through difficult times and I, I'm incredibly grateful uh, for you all to, to be here today and to be thinking about uh, things that are bigger than ourselves. Uh, and, and so you should congratulate yourselves on that. And and I I think everybody is doing a fantastic job through the last few months. So I, I just want to um, send my, my regards <laughs> and wish you a very good evening and afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very cool. Uh, if you want to read the, the questions, the comments, you can uh, visit the, the YouTube channel. So, Certainly, absolutely. And if you leave your email address, I'll, I'll get back to you if you have any questions. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> so I also thank the whole virtual audience you have had today. I hope <laughs> meet you all of you next Tuesday or in the next seminar because you don't are totally sure about the next seminar if it will be next week or uh, two weeks ahead so uh stay tuned good evening for both british and brazil audience i'm not sure if you have had a uh, rich uh, people watching you in this excellent seminar so Bye, Rafael. Thank you so much for having accepted our invitation. Thank you, Andre. Bye, everyone.